Bill's eyes were animated. Do you see what's happening? He asked. This means that Feynman's original intention was actually to perfect and decentralize the technology he's working on. If he realizes this fact, he will stop the experiment. We've got to find him, I said. No, Will replied, pausing to think. That won't help. Not yet. We've got to find the rest of this group of seven. It must take the pooled energy of a group to bring in the memory of the world vision, a group that can work through the process of remembering and energize themselves. I don't understand this part about clearing residual feelings. Will moved closer. Remember the other mental images you've been having? The memories of other places, other times? Yes. The group that is forming to deal with this experiment has been together before. There will be residual feelings that must be worked through. Everyone will have to deal with them. Will looked away for a moment, then said, This is more of the tenth insight. Not just one group is coming in. There are many others. We'll all have to learn to clear these resentments. As he spoke, I thought about the group situations I'd experienced. Some members of the group liked each other immediately, while others seemed to fall into instant discord for no apparent reason. I wondered, was human culture now ready to perceive the distant source of these unconscious reactions? Then, without warning, another shrill sound reverberated through my body. Will grabbed me and pulled me closer, our faces almost touching. If you fall again, I don't know if you can get back while the experiment is operating at this level, he shouted. You'll have to find the others. A second blast ripped us apart, and I felt myself release into the familiar swirling colors, knowing that I was heading back, as before, into the Earth dimension. Yet, this time, instead of tumbling quickly into the physical, I seemed to linger momentarily. Something was pulling at my solar plexus, moving me laterally. As I strained to focus, the surging environment calmed, and I began to sense the presence of another person, without actually seeing the individual's form. I could almost remember the character of the feeling. Who makes me feel this way? At last, I began to discern a blurry figure thirty or forty feet away, which moved closer, gradually, until I recognized who it was. Charlene. As she closed to within ten feet, I sensed a shift in my body, as though I was suddenly relaxing more completely. Simultaneously, I noticed a pinkish-red energy field that encircled Charlene. Seconds later, to my amazement, I noticed an identical field around myself. When we were about five feet from each other, the relaxation in my body grew into an increased sensuousness, and finally into a wave of orgasmic love. I suddenly couldn't think. What was happening? Just as our fields were about to touch, a shrill dissonance returned, and I was jolted backward again, twisting out of control. As my head cleared, I gradually became aware of something cold and wet against my right cheek. Slowly I opened my eyes, the rest of my body frozen in place. For a moment, the half-grown wolf looked at me and sniffed hard, his tail bristling, then dashed into the woods as I jerked back and sat up. In a tired stupor, I retrieved my pack in the fading light and walked into the thick trees and raised my tent, afterward virtually collapsing into the sleeping bag. For a moment I struggled to stay awake, intrigued by my strange meeting with Charlene. Why had she been in the other dimension? What had drawn us together? The next morning I awoke early and made oatmeal, wolfing it down, and then made my way carefully back to the small creek I'd passed on my way up the ridge to wash my face and fill my canteen. I still felt tired, but I was also anxious to find Curtis. Suddenly I was jolted to my feet by the sound of an explosion toward the east. That had to be Curtis, I thought, as I ran to the tent. A wave of fear passed through me as I quickly packed and headed toward the sound of the blast. After about half a mile, the woods ended abruptly at what appeared to be an abandoned pasture. Several strands of rusty barbed wire hung loosely between the trees in my path. I surveyed the open field and the line of trees and dense brush a hundred yards beyond. At that moment the bushes parted, and Curtis burst through and headed in a dead run straight toward me. I waved, and he slowed to a fast walk. When he reached me, he carefully climbed through the barbed wire and collapsed against a tree, breathing rapidly. 
What happened? I asked. What did you blow up? He shook his head. I couldn't do much. They were running the experiment underground. I didn't have enough explosives, and I, I didn't want to hurt the people inside. All I could do was blow up an outside dish antenna, which hopefully will delay them. He paused for a moment as we heard the sound of trucks in the distance. We'll have to get out of this valley, he continued, and find some help. We don't have any choice now. They'll be coming. Wait a minute, I said. I think we have a chance to stop them, but we've got to find Maya and Charlene. His eyes widened. Are you talking about Charlene Billings? That's right. I know her. She used to do some contract research for the corporation. I haven't seen her for years, but I saw her last night, going into the underground bunker. She was walking with several men, all of them, heavily armed. Were they holding her against her will? I couldn't tell, Curtis said distractedly, his ears tuned to the trucks, which now seemed to be heading in our direction. We've got to get out of here. I know a place where we can hide until dark, but we'll have to hurry. He looked back toward the east. I set a false trail, but it won't sidetrack him for long. I've got to tell you what happened, I said. I found Will again. Right, right, tell me on the way, he said, walking quickly. We've got to move. I looked out of the mouth of the cave and across the deep gorge to the opposite hillside. No movement. I listened carefully, but could hear nothing. We had walked in a northeasterly direction for about a mile, and as quickly as I could I had told Curtis what I had experienced in the other dimension, stressing my belief that Williams had been correct. We could stop this experiment if we could find the rest of the group and remember the larger vision. I could tell Curtis was resisting. He had listened for a while, but then began rambling about his past association with Charlene. I was frustrated that he knew nothing that might explain what she had to do with this experiment. He also told me how he had come to know David. They had become friends, he explained, after a chance meeting had revealed many common experiences in the military. I told him it was significant that he and I both had an association with David and that we knew Charlene. I don't know what it means, he had said distractedly, and I dropped it, but I knew it was further proof that we had all come to this valley for a reason. Afterward, we had walked in silence as Curtis searched for the cave. When we had found it, he backtracked and erased our tracks with dead pine branches, and then had lingered outside until he was convinced we hadn't been seen. So, how do you think this group can build enough energy to have an effect on these people? he asked. I'm not sure exactly, I replied. We'll have to figure it out. He shook his head. I don't think anything like that is possible. Probably all I did with my little bit of explosives was to irritate them and put them more on guard. Maybe I should have taken out the door. No, no, I don't think so, I said. We're going to find the other way. How? It'll come to us. Suddenly we heard the faint sound of the vehicles again, and simultaneously I noticed a movement on the down slope below us. Someone's out there, I said. We crouched down and looked closely. The figure moved again, partially obscured by the underbrush. That's Maya, I said, disbelieving. Curtis and I stared at each other for a long moment. Finally I moved to get up. I'll go get her. He grabbed my arm. Stay low. And if the vehicles close in, leave her and come back here. Don't risk being seen. I nodded and ran carefully down the hill. When I was close enough, I stopped and listened. The trucks were still moving closer. I called out to her in a low voice. She froze for an instant, then recognized me and climbed up a rocky slope to where I stood. I can't believe I found you, she said, hugging my neck. I led the way back to the cave and helped her through the opening in the rock. She appeared exhausted, and her arms were covered with scratches, some of them still bleeding. What happened? she asked. I heard an explosion, and then those trucks were everywhere. Did anyone see you come this way? Curtis asked with irritation. He was up and looking outside. I don't think so, she said. I was able to hide. I quickly introduced them. Curtis nodded and said, I think I'll take a look. He slipped out through the opening and disappeared. I opened my pack and took out a first aid kit. Were you able to find your friend with the sheriff's office? No, I couldn't even get back to town. There were interior officials along all the paths back. I saw a woman I knew and gave her a note to take to him. That's all I could do. 
I applied some antiseptic to a long gash across Maya's knee. So why didn't you leave with the woman you saw? Why did you change your mind and come back here? I don't know why I came back. Maybe because I kept having these memories. She looked up at me. I want to understand what's happening here. I sat down facing her and gave her a sketchy summary of everything that had happened since we parted, particularly the information Will and I had received about the group process of moving past the resentment to find the world vision. She looked overwhelmed, but seemed to accept her role. I noticed you weren't limping any longer. Yeah, I guess it cleared up when I remembered where it came from. She stared at me for a moment and then said, There are only three of us. You said Williams and Feynman had both seen seven. Where do you think they are? I don't know, I replied. I'm just glad you're here. You're the one who knows about faith and visualization. A few moments later, Curtis came back through the opening and told us he had seen nothing out of the ordinary. Curtis leaned back and handed her a canteen. You know, you took a hell of a risk walking around in the open like that. You could have led them right to us. Maya glanced at me and then said defensively, I was trying to get away. I didn't know you were up here. I wouldn't even have come this way if the birds hadn't caught my attention with the noise they were making. Well, you've got to understand how much trouble we're in, Curtis interrupted. We still haven't stopped this experiment. He got up and stepped outside again and sat behind a large rock near the opening. Why is he so mad at me? Maya asked. Well, you said you were having memories, Maya. What kind? I don't know. Of another time, I guess, trying to stop some other violence. That's why this is all so eerie to me. Does Curtis seem familiar to you? She struggled to think. Maybe. I don't know. Why? Do you remember when I told you earlier about seeing a vision of all of us in the past during the Native American Wars? Well, you were killed, and someone else was with you who seemed to be following your lead, and he was killed too. I think it was Curtis. He blames me? Oh, God, no wonder he's so mad. Maya, can you remember anything about what you two were doing? She closed her eyes again and tried to think. Suddenly she looked at me. Was a Native American also there? A shaman? Yes, I said. He was killed too. We were thinking about something. She suddenly looked me in the eye. No. No, we were visualizing. We thought we could stop the war. Oh, that's all I can get. You, you've got to talk to Curtis and work through this anger. It's part of the process of remembering. Are you kidding with him this angry? I'll go speak to him first, I said, standing up. She nodded slightly and looked away. I moved to the cave's opening, crawled out, and sat down beside Curtis. What do you think? I asked. He looked at me, slightly embarrassed. I think there's something about your friend that makes me mad. Well, what are you feeling exactly? I don't know. I felt angry as soon as I saw her out there. I got the sense she might pull some blunder and expose us or get us captured. Maybe killed? Yeah, maybe killed. Remember when I told you about the visions I saw? of a time during the 19th century Native American wars? Vaguely, he muttered. Well, I didn't tell you then, but I think I saw you and Maya together. Curtis, you were both killed by soldiers. He looked at the ceiling of the cave. And you think that's why I'm angry at her? I smiled. At that moment, a light dissonance filled the air, and we both heard the hum. Damn, he said. They're firing it up again. I grabbed his arm. Curtis, we've got to figure out what you and Meyer were trying to do back then, why you failed, and what you intended to happen differently this time. He shook his head. I don't know how much of all of this I even believe. I wouldn't know where to begin. I think if you just talk to her, something will come up. He just looked at me. Will you try? Finally he nodded, and we crawled back into the cave. Maya smiled awkwardly. I'm sorry I've been so angry, Curtis offered. Seems maybe I'm mad about something that occurred a long time ago. Forget it, she said. I just wish we could remember what we were trying to do. Curtis looked hard at Maya. I seem to remember you're into healing of some kind. He glanced at me. Did you tell me that? 
I don't think so, I replied, but it's true. I'm a physician, Maya said. I use positive imaging and faith in my work. Faith? You mean you treat people from a religious perspective? Well, only in a general sense. When I said faith, I meant the energy force that comes from human expectation. I work at a clinic where we're trying to understand faith as an actual mental process, as the way we help create the future. And how long have you been into all this? Curtis asked. Maya didn't answer. She stood up and stared straight ahead, a panicked look on her face. What's wrong? I asked. I was just... I... See, what happened during the wars? What was it? Curtis asked. She looked at him. I remember we were there in the woods. I can see it all. The soldiers. Smoke from the gunpowder. Curtis seemed to be pulled into deep thought, obviously picking up on the memory. I was there, he mumbled. Why was I there? He looked at Maya. You brought me to that place. I knew nothing. I was just a congressional observer. You told me we could stop the fighting. I'm sorry, she said. I can't remember what went wrong. I know what went wrong, he said. You thought you could stop a war just because you wanted to. She gazed at him for a long moment, then looked at me. He's right. We were visualizing that the soldiers must stop their aggression, but we had no clear picture of how that could happen. It didn't work because we didn't have all the information. Everyone was visualizing from fear, not faith. It works just like the process of healing in our bodies. When we remember what we're really supposed to do in life, it can restore our health. When we're able to remember what all humanity is supposed to do, starting right now from this moment, we can heal the world. Apparently, I continued, our birth vision contains not only what we individually intended to do in the physical dimension, but also a larger vision of what humans have been trying to do throughout history, and the details of where we are going from here and how to get there. We just have to amplify our energy and share our birth intentions, and then we can remember. Before she could respond, Curtis jumped to his feet and moved to the cave's opening. I heard something, he said. Someone's out there. Maya and I crouched beside him, straining to see. Nothing moved. Then I thought I detected the rustling sound of someone walking. I'm going to check this out, Curtis said, moving through the opening. I glanced at Maya. I'd better go with him. I'm coming too, she said. We followed Curtis down the slope to an outcropping, where we could look straight down at the gorge between the two hills. A man and a woman, partially obscured by the underbrush, we're crossing the rocks below us, heading toward the west. That woman's in trouble, Maya said. How do you know that? I asked. I just know. She looks familiar. The woman turned once, and the man pushed her, menacingly, exposing a pistol held in his right hand. The woman had light hair and was dressed in green fatigues with leg pockets and a sweatshirt. That's Charlene, I said. Where do you think they're taking her? Who knows? Curtis replied. Look, I think I can help her, but I have to go alone. I need both of you to stay here. I protested, but Curtis would have it no other way. We watched him as he walked back to the left and down the slope through a section of woods. From there, he crept quietly to another outcropping of rock just ten feet above the bottom of the gorge. They'll have to pass right by him, I told Maya. We observed anxiously as they moved closer to the rocks. At the precise moment they had passed, Curtis suddenly bounded down the hill and leaped upon the man, knocking him to the ground and holding his throat in a peculiar fashion until he stopped moving. Charlene jumped back in alarm and gathered herself to run. Charlene, wait! Curtis called. She stopped and took a cautious step forward. It's Curtis Farrell. We work together at Dell Tech, remember? I'm here to help you. She obviously recognized him and moved closer. Maya and I made our way carefully down the hill. When Charlene saw me, she froze and then ran toward my embrace. Curtis rushed up and pushed us to the ground. Keep down, he said. We could be seen here. I helped Curtis tie up Charlene's guard with a roll of tape we found in his pocket and pulled him up the slope into the forest. What did you do to him? Charlene asked. Curtis was checking his pockets. I just knocked him out. He'll be okay. Maya bent down to check his pulse. 
Charlene turned her attention to me, reaching out for my hand. How did you get here? she asked. Taking a breath, I told her about the call from her office informing me of her disappearance and about finding the sketch and coming to the valley to look for her. She smiled. I made that sketch intending to call you, but I left so suddenly I didn't have time. Her voice trailed off as she looked deeply into my eyes. Finally, she said, I think I saw you yesterday in the other dimension. I pulled her to the side, away from the others. I saw you, too, but I couldn't communicate. As we stared at each other, I felt my body grow lighter, a wave of orgasmic love sweeping across me, centered not in my pelvic region, but somehow around the outside of my skin. Simultaneously, I seemed to be falling into Charlene's eyes. Her smile grew, and I realized she must be feeling much the same way. A movement from Curtis broke the spell, and I realized both he and Maya were staring at us. I looked back at Charlene. I want to tell you what's been happening, I said, then described seeing Will again, learning about the polarization of fear and the group coming back. Charlene, how did you get into the afterlife dimension? Her face fell. All this is my fault. I didn't know the danger until yesterday. While you were still in Peru, I found out about another group that knew of the Nine Insights and studied with them intensely. I had many of the same experiences you talked about in the letter you wrote. Later, I came with a friend to this valley because we had heard that the sacred locations here were connected somehow to the Tenth Insight. My friend didn't experience much, but I did, so I stayed to explore. That's when I met Feynman, who employed me to teach him what I knew. With Feynman, I explored most of the vortexes, especially the ones at Cotter's Knoll in the falls. He couldn't sense the energy personally, but I found out later that he was tracking us electronically and getting some sort of energy profile on me as we tuned into the spot. After that, he could home in on the area and find the exact location of the vortex electronically. I glanced at Curtis, and he nodded knowingly. Tears filled Charlene's eyes. He had me completely fooled. He said that he was working on a very inexpensive source of energy that will liberate everyone. He sent me to remote areas of the forest during much of the experimentation. Only later, after I confronted him, did he admit the dangers of what he was doing. Curtis turned to face Charlene. Feynman Carter was a chief engineer at Del Tech. Do you remember? No, she said but he's totally in control of this project. Another corporation is now involved, and they have these armed men. Feynman calls them operatives. I finally told him I was leaving, and that's when he put me under guard. When I told him he would never get away with this, he just laughed. He bragged about having someone in the interior department working with him. Where was he sending you? Curtis asked. Charlene shook her head. I have no idea. I don't think he intended to let you live, Curtis said, not after telling you all that. I became aware that Charlene was staring at Maya and smiling. Maya returned the gaze with a warm expression. When I was at the falls, Charlene said, I moved through and into the other dimension, and all these memories rushed in. She looked at me. After that, I was able to go back several times, even when I was under guard yesterday. She looked at me. That's where I saw you. Charlene paused and looked back at the group. I saw that we're all here to stop this experiment, if we can remember everything. Maya was watching her closely. You understood what we wanted to do during the battle with the soldiers, and supported us, even though you knew it couldn't work. Charlene's smile told me she had remembered. We've remembered most of what happened, I said but so far we haven't been able to recall how we plan to do it differently this time. Can you remember? Charlene shook her head. Only parts of it. I know we have to identify our unconscious feelings toward one another before we can go on. She looked into my eyes and paused. This is all part of the Tenth Insight, only it hasn't been written down anywhere yet. It's coming in intuitively. I nodded. We know. Part of the Tenth is an extension of the Eighth. Only a group that's operating fully in the Eighth Insight 
can accomplish this kind of higher clearing. I'm not following you, Curtis said. The eighth is about knowing how to uplift others, she continued. Knowing how to send energy by focusing on another's beauty and higher self-wisdom. This process can raise the energy level and creativity of the group exponentially. Unfortunately, many groups have trouble uplifting each other in this manner, even though the individuals involved are able to do it at other times. This is especially true if the group is work-oriented, a group of employees, for instance, or people coming together to create a unique project of some kind, because so often these people have been together before. The problem is that old past-life emotions come up and get in the way. We are thrown together with someone we have to work with, and we automatically dislike them without really knowing why. Or perhaps we experience it the other way around. The person doesn't like us, again for reasons we don't understand. The emotions that come up might be jealousy, irritation, envy, resentment, bitterness, blame, any of these. What I intuited very clearly was that no group could reach its highest potential unless the participants seek to understand and work through these emotions. Maya leaned forward. That's exactly what we've been doing, working through the emotions that have come up, the resentments from when we were together before. Were you shown your birth vision? I asked. Yes, Charlene replied, but I couldn't get any further. I didn't have enough energy. All I saw was that groups were forming and that I was supposed to be here in this valley, in a group of seven. Where were the others? Presently the sound of another vehicle, far to the north, attracted our attention. We can't stay here, Curtis said. We're too exposed. Let's get back to the cave. Charlene finished the last of the food and handed me the plate. Having no extra water, I placed it in my pack, dirty, and sat down again. Curtis slipped through the mouth of the cave and sat down across from me beside Maya, who smiled faintly at him. Charlene sat to my left. The operative had been left outside the cave, still bound and gagged. Is everything okay outside? Charlene asked Curtis. Curtis looked nervous. I think so. And I heard some more sounds to the north. I think we need to stay in here, in the cave, until dark. For a moment we all just looked at each other, each of us obviously trying to raise our energy. Finally, I looked at the others and told them about the process of reaching the world vision I had seen with Feynman's soul group. When I had concluded, I looked at Charlene and asked, What else did you receive about this clearing process? All I got, Charlene replied, was that the process couldn't begin until we came totally back to love. Well, that's easy to say, Curtis said. The problem is doing it. We all looked at each other. Then simultaneously we realized the energy was moving to Maya. The key is to acknowledge the emotion, to become fully conscious of the feeling, and then to share it honestly, no matter how awkward our attempts. This brings the emotion fully into present awareness and ultimately allows it to be relegated to the past where it belongs. That's why going through the sometimes long process of saying it, discussing it, putting it on the table, clears us, so that we are able to return to a state of love which is the highest emotion. For a moment, we all looked at each other, and I realized that most of the negative emotion had dissipated. Wait a minute, I said. What about Charlene? There may be residual emotions toward her. I looked at Maya. I know you felt something. Yes, Maya replied, but only positive feelings, a sense of gratitude. She stayed and tried to help. Maya paused, studying Charlene's face, you tried to tell us something, something about the ancestors, but we didn't listen. I leaned toward Charlene. Were you killed, too? Maya answered for her. No, she wasn't killed. She had gone to try to appeal to the soldiers one more time. That's right, but the troopers were gone. Maya asked, Who else feels something towards Charlene? I don't feel anything, Curtis said. What about you, Charlene? I asked. What do you feel toward us? For a moment, her gaze swept across each member of the group. There doesn't seem to be any residual feeling toward Curtis, she said. And everything is positive toward Maya. Her eyes settled on mine. Toward you. I think I feel a bit of resentment. Why? I asked. 
because you were so practical and detached. You were this independent man who wasn't about to get involved if the timing wasn't perfect. Charlene, I said, I'd already sacrificed myself for these insights as a monk. I felt it would have been useless. My protest seemed to irritate her, and she looked away. Maya reached over and touched me. Your comment was defensive. When you respond that way, the other person doesn't feel heard. The emotion she harbors then lingers in her mind because she continues to think of ways to make you understand, to convince you. Or it goes unconscious, and then there's ill feeling that dulls the energy between you two. Either way, the emotion remains a problem, getting in the way. I suggest you acknowledge how she could be feeling that. I looked at Charlene. Oh, I do. I wish that I had helped. Maybe I could have done something if I'd had the courage. Charlene nodded and smiled. How about you? Maya asked, looking at me. What do you feel toward Charlene? I guess I feel some guilt, I said. Not so much guilt about the war, but now, about this situation. I had been withdrawn for several months. I think if I'd talked to you immediately after returning from Peru, maybe we could have stopped the experiment earlier, and none of this would be happening. No one replied. Are there any other feelings? Maya asked. We only looked at each other. At this point, under Maya's direction, each of us focused on connecting inside, with building as much energy as we could. As I focused on the beauty around me, a wave of love swept through my body. The muted color of the cave walls and floor began to brighten and glow. Each person's face began to appear more energized. A chill ran up my spine. Now, Maya said, we're ready to figure out what we intended to do this time. She again appeared to be in deep thought. I... I knew this was going to happen, she said finally. This was part of my birth vision. I was to lead the amplification process. We didn't know how to do this when we tried to stop the war on the Native Americans. As she spoke, I noticed a movement behind her against the cave wall. At first I thought it was a reflection of light, but then I detected a deep shade of green exactly like the one I witnessed earlier when observing Maya's soul group. As I struggled to focus on the foot-square blob of light, it swelled into a full holographic scene, receding into the wall itself, full of fuzzy, human-like forms. I glanced at the others. No one seemed to see the image except me. This, I knew, was Maya's soul group. Once free of the emotions, Maya was now saying, a group can more easily move past power struggles and dramas and find its full creativity. But we have to do it consciously by finding a higher self-expression in every face. I watched Maya, attempting to find her higher expression. No longer did she appear tired or reluctant in any way. Instead, her features revealed a certainty and genius she had not expressed before. I glanced toward the others and saw that they were similarly focused on Maya. When I looked at her again, I noticed she seemed to be taking on the green hue of her soul group. She was not only picking up on their knowledge, she seemed to be moving into a kind of harmony with them. Maya had stopped speaking and was taking a deep breath. I could feel the energy shifting away from her. I've always known that groups could acquire a higher level of functioning, Curtis suddenly said, especially in work settings. But I haven't been able to experience this until now. I know I came into this dimension to be involved in transforming business and shifting our view of business creativity so that we can ultimately utilize the new energy sources in the correct way and implement the ninth insight automation of production. I, I felt as though business, too, was moving into a spiritual awareness and that we needed a new kind of business ethic. At that moment, I saw another movement of light directly behind Curtis. I watched for a few seconds, then I realized I was seeing the formation of his soul group as well. Only now, Curtis suddenly said, are we ready to understand how to evolve business and the resulting new technology in a conscious manner? All the measures are now in place. It's not an accident that one of the most important statistical categories in economics is the productivity index, the record of how many goods and services are produced by each individual in our society. 
Gains in productivity have steadily increased because of technological discoveries and the more expansive use of natural resources and energy. Through the years, the individual has found ever greater ways to create. As he spoke, a thought came to me. At first, I decided to keep it to myself, but then everyone looked my way. Doesn't the environmental damage that economic growth is causing form a natural limit to business? Many of the fish in the ocean are already so polluted we can't eat them. Cancer rates are increasing exponentially. Even the AMA says that pregnant women and children should not eat commercial vegetables because of the pesticide residue. If this keeps up, can you imagine what kind of world we'll be leaving our children? As soon as I had said this, I recalled what Joel had said earlier about the collapse of the environment. I could feel my energy falling as I felt the same fear. Suddenly, I was hit with a burst of energy as each of the others stared in an effort to find my authentic expression again. I quickly reestablished my inner connection. You're right, Curtis said, but our response to this problem is already shifting. We've been advancing technology with a kind of unconscious tunnel vision, forgetting that we're here on an organic planet, an energy planet. But one of the most creative areas of business is the field of pollution control. Our problem has been trying to depend on government to police the polluters. Polluting has been against the law for a long time, but there will never be enough government regulation to prevent the illegal dumping of waste chemicals or the midnight venting of smokestacks. This polluting of the biosphere won't completely stop until an alarmed citizenry pulls out their video recorders and takes it upon themselves to catch those people in the act. In a sense, business and the employees of business must regulate themselves. Maya leaned forward. I see another problem with the way the economy is evolving. What about all the displaced workers who are losing their jobs as more of the economy is automated? How can they survive? We used to have a large middle class, and now it is diminishing rapidly. Curtis smiled, and his eyes brightened. The image of his soul group swelled behind him. These displaced people were survived by learning to live intuitively and synchronistically, he said. We all have to understand. There's no going back. We're already living in the information age. Everyone will have to educate themselves the best they can, become an expert in some niche, so that they can be in the right place to advise someone else or perform some other service. The more technical automation becomes and the more quickly the world changes, the more we need information from just the right person arriving in our lives at just the right time. You don't need a formal education to do that. Just a niche you've created for yourself through self-education. A new code of ethics is being added to the equation of free enterprise. We can move toward a truly enlightened capitalism if, instead of charging as much as the market will bear, we follow a new business ethic based on lowering our prices a specified percentage as a conscious statement of where we want the economy to go. This would be the business equivalent of engaging in the ninth insight force of tithing. Charlene turned to face him, her face luminous. I understand what you're saying. You mean if all businesses reduce prices 10%, then everyone's cost of living, including the raw material and supplies to the businesses themselves, will also go down. That's right. Although some prices might go up temporarily as everyone takes into account the true cost of waste disposal and other environmental effects... Overall, though, prices will systematically decline. Do you really think enough people will reduce prices to make a difference? Maya asked, especially if it takes money out of their own pockets. That seems to fly in the face of human nature. Curtis didn't answer. Instead, he looked at me, along with the others, as if I had the answer. For a moment, I was silent, feeling the energy shift. Curtis is right, I said finally. We'll do it anyway even though we may give up some personal profit in the short run. None of this makes any sense at all until we grasp the ninth and tenth insights. If one grasps the first nine insights and sees life in spiritual terms as a spiritual evolution with spiritual responsibilities, then our view completely changes. And once we begin to understand the tenth, then we see the birth process from the perspective of the afterlife and we realize that we're all here to bring the earth dimension into alignment with the heavenly sphere. Besides, opportunity and success is a very mysterious process, 
And if we operate our economic life in the flow of the overall plan, we synchronistically meet all the other people who are doing the same thing, and suddenly, prosperity opens up for us. We'll do it, I continued, because individually, that's where the intuition and coincidences will take us. We'll remember more about our birth visions, and it will become clear that we intended to make a certain contribution to the world. And most importantly, we'll know that if we don't follow this intuition, not only will the magic coincidences and the sense of inspiration and aliveness stop, but eventually we may have to look at our actions in an afterlife review. We'll have to face our failure. I stopped abruptly, noticing that Charlene and Maya were both staring wide-eyed at the space behind me. I turned around. Behind me was the hazy outline of my own soul group, dozens of individuals fading into the distance, again as though the wall of the cave weren't there. What are all of you looking at? Curtis asked. It's his soul group, Charlene said. I've seen a group behind both Maya and Curtis, I said. Maya twisted around and looked at the space behind her. The group there flickered once and then came fully into focus. I don't see anything, Curtis said. Where are they? Maya continued to stare, obviously seeing all of the groups. They're helping us, aren't they? Yes, Charlene replied, looking directly at me. She started to say something else, then stopped herself, appearing to drift off in thought momentarily. Finally, she said, I'm beginning to understand what I saw in the other dimension. In the afterlife, each of us comes from a particular soul group, and these groups each have a particular angle or truth to offer the rest of humanity. She glanced at me. For instance, you come from a group of facilitators. Do you know that? Souls that help evolve our philosophical understanding of what life is about. Everyone who belongs to this particular soul group is always trying to find the best and most comprehensive way of describing spiritual reality. You struggle with complex information, and because you're so dense, you keep pushing and exploring until you find a way to express it clearly. I looked at her askance, which made her burst out laughing. It's a gift you have, she said, reassuringly. Turning to Maya, she said, And you, Maya, your soul group is oriented toward health and well-being. They think of themselves as soldiers of the physical dimension, keeping our cells operating optimally and full of energy, tracing and removing emotional blocks before they manifest in disease. Curtis's group is about transforming the use of technology, as well as our overall understanding of commerce. Throughout human history, this group has been working to spiritualize our concepts of money and capitalism, to find the ideal conceptualization. She paused, and I could already see an image of light flickering behind her. <laughs>